is a big word. It, it's, a, it's a conjunction, and it uh, lays down um, uh, a condition. The word usually indicates there's a choice, and if the action is done according to the way we want the choice, then we will do it. You follow that? Um, uh, there, if we do something, there is a consequences. If the action is not done, then there is another consequences. The word because really is more definitive. Uh, because something happens, there is a definite result. So we got these two words, if and because. Now I want you to take your guide, this little insert out. I'll, it may help you follow as we think through this big if. The, this little word if is a powerful word used in the Bible in the King James translation, and it is used 1,572 times. And in the New International Version, due to the translation differences, there's, it's used 1,758 times. It is often used as a conditional phrase that something must be met for a promise of God to be fulfilled. Look at Deuteronomy 8.19. But I assure you of this, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will be certainly destroyed. Now what is the promise there? God will destroy you. When would God do something like this? Would you forget him and follow other gods? Should be a warning to us today, shouldn't it, in a world? Let's personalize this verse and use the word because. Because I forget the Lord my God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, I will be destroyed. D do you see the word if gives us a choice? The promise is conditional based upon how we choose to respond to the condition. Because you follow other gods, you'll be destroyed. Or because I do not forget the Lord my God and follow other gods, worship it and bow down to them, I will not be destroyed. Do you see that? Look at Psalm 66, 18. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. What, what is the negative implication of this verse? If I had not confessed my sin, what is the promise? God would not have listened. See, there are two choices and two different implications. Because I do confess the sin in my heart, the Lord listens to me. Or because I have not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord does not listen to me. What does this say to us about the way we approach God and, and the necessity of confessing sin? In this psalm, the indication is, the psalmist indicates that he really confessed his sins. I mean, listen to the context of this verse. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. I cried out to him for help, praising him as I spoke. If I had not confessed my sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. The indication is there in this context that he did confess his sin. Look at Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you put the word because in there. Because I have confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I am saved. Or because I have not confessed him with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and do not believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, 
I am not saved. Now, are you beginning to see the importance of this little word that really is a big word, if? More often than not, that when you read the Bible, in, if indicates that you and I have a choice. The choice we make reveals whether or not we will experience the desired outcome uh, of God's promise, whether it be negative or positive. John 14, 15, look at it. If you love me, you obey my commands. You put the word because, because I love you, I obey your commands. What is the implication if you don't obey Jesus' command? You don't love him. Because I do not love Jesus, I do not obey his commandments. Perhaps, at least for me, one of the most difficult teachings in the New Testament is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he said, if, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is really a big if, isn't it? What is God's promise when you forgive those who've sinned against you, those who have used you, those who have hurt you, who did harm, caused ill or negative feelings in you? Because I forgive those who have sinned against me, who have caused negative feelings to arouse in me, who insulted and abused me, who have caused me grief, my heavenly Father forgives me. Because I forgive those who have sinned against me, my heavenly Father forgives me. But what happens if you do not forgive? If you refuse to forgive? What is the promise? Because I refuse to forgive others, those who have assaulted me, those who have hurt me, those who have caused me grief, my Heavenly Father will not forgive me. Reading that puts it in another light, doesn't it? I am convinced in all my journey of years of serving the Lord and walking with people, the number one obstacle to the most damaging and pain and unhappiness in a person is that somewhere there has been unforgiveness. There's somewhere that the, the pain or the grief or the disappointment caused, the person is hung on to it, and it's just detrimental to receiving the joy of Christ. Now the question is, how do you know when you haven't let go of something? Well, think about your memory. If something comes to mind and out of your mouth still comes ill will and complaining and negatory type expressions, that could be an indication that you haven't dealt with that and you haven't released it. Or, or suppose it's toward another person. Every time that person's name is mentioned, you get these ill thoughts in your heart and mind. And, and the first words that come out is to put that person down. That's a good indication you haven't forgiven. Sometimes something has happened so long ago that caused so much pain, and, and it could be terrible pain, abuse of some form that it so scarred us that we still carry it. And, and Hebrews talks about building a, a root of bitterness that goes deep in the soul. And that bitter root poisons our life and how we look at life. Often, I think, very negative, grouchy, complaining people tend to be people that have been hurt so painfully in their life. And they may not even recall what it was. And, and it just keeps pouring out of them. How do you know if you have worked through forgiveness? First of all, we've got to realize that forgiveness is not something 
that just happens. We have to will it in our minds, give it to God, and ask him to help us. I mean, when we've been hurt, we react. So we have to say, Lord, you, this is the command that you give me. I want to work through it. Help me forgive that person. Sometimes it's a process. And how do you know if you're working through the process? Well, it could be when that subject is mentioned, you can still remember it, but the pain and the bitterness is not there. You got that? Or it could be if it's toward another person that you see this other person and you're free to be yourself. Oh, 25 years ago, I had to work through a, a real painful experience in the life of the church. And uh, there, it was, the, in my opinion, the root cause was somebody who, who acted very unchristlike. That, that's my judgment. And I had to ask God to really help me to forgive. And I had, whenever it came up, Lord, you got to help me. And uh, <clears throat> there was a time if I saw this person coming down the street, you know what I would do? I'd go the other way. <laughs> Now, who was controlling whom? And then one day at the door of the hospital in Dunn, I saw the person. I walked up, shook his hands. I had no bitter feelings, and I accepted him where he was. And after that, I looked and said, Lord, thank you. That is a milestone. Now, how many of us want to experience God's forgiveness? most difficult thing to do. And yet, you know, Jesus never commanded us to do something he didn't do himself. Remember the scene on the cross? Beaten, scarred, people ridiculing them, cheering that he was being crucified. And what did he pray? Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Who won? Who won? Yeah. Well, let's look at 1 John 8, 1, 8, and 10. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all, all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. There are three big gifts in this verse. Look what happens when we put the word. Because I claim I do sin, I am not fooling myself and I live in the truth. Or look at it this way. Because... I claim I do not have sin. I am not fooling myself and not living in the truth. Look at what happens in the next verse when we confess our sins. Because I confess my sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me from all wickedness. Or because I do not confess my sins to him, he is faithful and just and will not forgive me of my sins and will not cleanse me from all unwickedness. The next one's a big one. Because I claim I have not sinned, I am calling God a liar and show his word has no place in my heart. Or because I claim I have sinned, I am not calling God a liar and I will show that his word has a place in my heart. I want to share what is, the Bible indicates, it is an absolute necessary step for the spirit to break loose and that is we confess our sins and you know what most of us never confess any sin isn't that true I want you to listen to a verse from Romans 
623. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I want you to know it doesn't say the wage of sin is death. This is spiritual death. It's the wages. It's, it's the accumulative effect of repeating the sin over and over again that eventually there's going to be a spiritual death. And the only way to avoid that is to be caught up on confessing our sins. Because if, if we confess, he is faithful to forgive us. And, and here's what I think happens in the church. James says, but each, of, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Now, how do we in the church, how could we be prone to giving way to sin that leads to death? Let's take something very basic, gossip. You know, most gossips never know they're sinning. Do you know that? They don't mind sharing things with other people. But it is a sin in the Bible, isn't it? Doesn't scripture very clear say gossip is a sin when we pass on tales about other people, particularly negative tales? And what happens is we start doing it and we do it so much we become hardened and we do not even realize we're, we're sinning. And there's a death spiritually in our life where the love of Christ cannot flow in and through our life as it needs to be. Do you understand that? Can, can you grab your heart and mind around that? It's not that we do major sins. It's that we don't see the little sins that we do. Selfishness. I had to call Joyce between services this morning because I was so convicted. Yesterday I sinned against her. Uh, she's recovering from this horrendous bout of bronchitis, but we went to some soccer games in Charlotte yesterday morning, or left at six o'clock to see two of our grandkids play soccer, got home before 12, and we were coming back, and we we're not familiar with that area, Charlotte, and we got turned around, and we had to get on 485, and um, she said, I was just this place yesterday. I said, well, where do we turn? She said, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I lost my cool. What do you mean you don't know? You're just here. And I had to get to a place I had to turn. Fortunately, we turned the right way. But we still wasn't sure. And I said, look this up on the, on the iPhone. Get, get the directions. Well, I don't know how to do it. I said, you've got to learn how to do it. <laughs> and I picked up the phone and said, don't you pick up the phone here? <laughs> pull off the road. And I pull off the road and... <clears throat> It was a quiet ride home. <laughs> but you know, she's right. She's never been taught to use that. And this morning, driving here, I was so convicted that I didn't apologize. I had sinned against my wife by my attitude. So I said, Joyce, self-centered and think what we want to receive from the church. The service
system's got to be the way I want it. The music's got to be the way I want it. The sermon's got to be the way I want it. Uh, I want the temper's got to be the way I want it. That we become sort of self-centered in what we want to get out of the church. That we forgot God calls us to be a people on mission. And the very existence of any church in any community is to be a lighthouse to the world for people who are not here. Maybe one of our subtle sins is we say, I can't witness. I will witness if the conditions are right. I'll invite my neighbor to church if I have time. And, and, and maybe, maybe one of the real weaknesses among us as God's people is we live as though we have no sin because we don't confess any. We never examine our life. We never look at where is God. We don't pray what David prayed. Search my heart, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. And slowly, the wages accumulate, those little things accumulate till we become deaf to the voice of God and we don't hear God anymore. I need a Savior. Do you need a Savior? There's no way I can atone. Once you see these songs on blood and things, I think, wow, there's cleansing. And what a promise. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive me. If I confess it, that means I've got to own something. That means I'm trying to become more like Christ. When I, when I say, Lord, I, I don't think this is the way you want me to live, I confess it to you. And Jesus, I love you. When was the last time you confessed a sin to God? Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and fill their land. When we use that, we said, those people need to turn from their wicked ways. <laughs> we said, if my people. It takes a humble person to seek the face of God, to want all that God wants to pour in his heart. And when wickedness is real, to turn from them, to repent and turn, then I will hear and heal. There's another scripture in James that's parallel to this. He says, confess your sins one to another and be healed. Isn't that interesting? That there is something therapeutic, something powerful that happens when we own the ugliness or the bruises or the disappointments in our life and give it to God that he brings healing. <clears throat> but if we keep them hidden in, it becomes wages that are accumulated <coughs> over and over again that so suddenly it leads to spiritual You want to see revival break out in Little Do you? Would you really like to see the power of God and people being brought to Christ? But it starts with us. If I confess, the big if, Lord, I confess, how often do you take a bath? really dirty. We just smell bad to unchurch people. Because these little sins blocks their view of Christ in us. So I'm going to invite you to do not only you know, just, just for a moment or two. For us to review this past week and see if there's some way I missed the mark. Some attitude that I've had. Some resentment I hold. I want to give it to God.
would you ask God to become transparent in your life and you become transparent with him? And if there's any way we have missed the mark this week, that we confess it. Lord, one of the greatest truths you teach us is that your grace is greater than our sin. Your capacity to forgive and cleanse is far greater than our willingness to examine our own lives. Father, forgive me, the sinner that I am. Forgive me when I can see the speck in my brother's eye, but cannot even see the log in my own eye. Forgive me when my attitude doesn't reflect your attitude. When I can hold on my hurts and disappointments, my resentments, and Lord, all that is not. Forgive me when I share things that I shouldn't share. I know it makes me feel good, but it must make you feel lousy. Lord, forgive me of missing opportunities because I've been so selfish with my time. I haven't even been willing to go next door to enter into the pain of a neighbor going through a tough time. Forgive me. Forgive us, Father. And we claim that truth that you do forgive us and that you do purify us and that you do love us. For your grace is greater than any sin. Your love is never ending. Lord, help us to walk into your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. <clears throat>